So, very quick introductions. You have the bios and the details, but on my right, Dr. Kerry Fasser, the Professor of Educational and Social Futures at the University of Bristol, and author of The Learning Futures. And uh, beside her is um, Obay El Kurdi, uh, who's a mechanical engineering student at McGill University, and he's part of the Learners' Voices community in, in, in WISE. Uh, representing the slightly younger generation, not too young, not that young, slightly younger generation. Mark, um, Mark Sermon is the executive director of the Mozilla Foundation, which was mentioned as well in Connie's uh, talk. And uh, Rabia Rabi Ataya is the founder and CEO of Bait.com, which is the largest Middle East, North Africa employment and jobs portal. So with that, I would like to start the conversation. Uh, and before we jump into our debate, we're going to show a short video of somebody who has the answer for this session. Can we? <laughs> I'm Jeff Stevens, the founder of uncollege.org, and I'm proof that you can be successful without having a college degree. I left school when I was 12, and instead of going to middle school or high school, learned how to educate myself. I found mentors, I built businesses, I did internships, and essentially used the world around me to create my own education. I think that the future is one in which a lot more people will be doing the same thing as the cost of getting a college degree rises at the same time that the efficacy and the employment of people who are graduating from college is decreasing. A college degree is no better than a signal. Um, getting a college degree signals that you are an interesting, smart human being who is ready to be employed. Fortunately, there are a lot of other ways to signal that. Portfolios, recommendations, past employment. Um, these are all ways that people signal that they can get, that they are ready for the workforce with ha having a college degree. What I challenge you as a panel to realize is that a future in which credentialing is a lot less important is not some far-fetched future, but rather a reality that is here. And you, as people who work at institutions of higher education, need to figure out how you're going to embrace this, or your institutions will be shortly bankrupt. So. I can see tears of approval from everybody here um, on, the, on college at all, but that's actually the debate that's going on now. He mentioned a few things, I think, that are much more fundamental for us to discuss. He mentioned that the cost was a prohibitive factor for him to follow, so he did this to shortcut some of that issue. He said that he was, and he is successful, so he was able to demonstrate and signal certain skills and capabilities to the workplace that did not need the degree. And he sort of talked in the, you know, uh, young generation's voice of a little bit of a rebellious approach to the system that's hardwired, which we can all agree is not perfect. So with that, a million questions would come up to mind, and I'm going to start with Mark. I'm going to ask the first question to Mark and just say, so w what is driving this trend? You know, is it, is it is, are, we, are we getting into badges and all of those new sorts of certifications because the technology is available? Or is this driven by the cost and we're trying to find better cost alternatives? Is this a pull from the labor market who are demanding different skills? Is it everything? What it's is driving all of this? It's everything. I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess the, the yes, the, I mean, there, there are a lot of dynamics in play. Our societies are changing, our economies are changing, technology is a part of that, global interconnection is a part of that. There, there's many things in, in play as we've discussed here at WISE. The core of, I think, this part of the debate really sits in, in Connie's two diagrams between that linear path uh, of, that we have in what we formally call education and that much more network path. And if you look on that, it, sort of how interests like music, uh, comic book collecting sort of led into actually what that career was. And ultimately, for me, the, the question that's in those two diagrams is how in this moment in history do we think about who we become? How at this moment in history do we think about who we aspire to be? How at this moment in history do we think about what opportunities are available to us and can we shape? And so that linear path in a, in a world where, which unsurprisingly looks like a factory uh, production line, uh, that linear path is sort of the, the way we have officially said this is how you choose who you become, and, and in certain professions, it's quite essential to who you become. And I don't want engineers, especially if they're building bridges and airplanes, not to have rigorous engineering training. But it's always been the case that there are many, many other factors on who we are uh, and what we're interested in. And that even is more so now that we can access whatever knowledge we want at, at our fingertips, 
that we can do so socially, whether that's face to face in a, in a city and get together and do music cheaply with computers or online globally across cultures. And so that aspect of who we become, which is outside of school, is so much richer now, can be so much richer now if we have access. So I, I think that's the opportunity space, that's the pressure, is we are, as we always have been, learning a lot outside of school, but I think even more and more and with more agency. So then the question becomes, how, if this is about who am I, how do I represent who am I? And a degree is a very, very, probably always, has been, but is now a very, very limited, and I would say bad, way to have as the only way that I represent who I am. And that, I think, is at the core of the pressure. Finding more nuanced ways where I have more agency over saying who I am in a way that others, especially employers, can understand, respect, and trust. Can we show the two slides from the Wise poll <clears throat> that actually have some insights on this debate? This is the poll that went out from Wise to everybody who participated. And the first question, one of the questions was company certifications, uh, some sort of badges or some other form of, form of recognition will challenge traditional diplomas. Um, and you can see the responses. Um, and there's a sort of a split, but it's, it's very much in that direction. But the other one, if we go to the other one, which is a little bit more interesting in the sense that it says content, the content for our future learning is going to come traditionally more and more from the online space. So I'm going to turn to Kerry with this to say, you know, this is about content, this is about the certification. It's not, a, doesn't seem like to be an anti-establishment discussion. The schools are needed, but the content is changing. What do you, what do you think about those two statistics that look like they're beyond degrees? Um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what I think about those two statistics, to be perfectly honest. Um, I want to ask a slightly different question. Do you mind if I just answer the question oh, I'm interested please. in asking? Um, <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. Yes, <laughs> so there is a question that we're ha the conversation that we're having here assumes that we all know what a degree is, um, and we're focusing on these bits of paper. Um, I'm interested in the question: you know, what does it mean to be at a university? What is a university for? Now, on one level, it gets framed into a question of certification. So you go to university, you get a certificate, and you try and swap that for a job. Okay, so this whole conversation is actually around something much more serious than just that bit of paper. Um, not least because we know that that bit of paper is becoming worth less and less. In the UK, in 1992, 19% of graduates were in non-graduate level jobs. In 2013, it was 38% of graduates were in non-graduate level jobs. So that bit of paper actually means less in a changing economic situation as well. So it's about relative composition, the competition. That's what you're buying when you're buying a certificate to swap for something else, okay? So that's one meaning of a degree. A second meaning of a degree is it's a place you go to basically to meet the person you're going to marry, okay? So you go there, you hang out, you make friends, you know, all that sort of stuff. And that's a huge part of growing up. But the third bit that is what I'm interested in is that we're in a situation of radical change. And I don't think it's actually a transition. I don't think it's a shift to another world that will then stay stable. I think it's a shift to a situation of constant morphogenetic change. So the, the point that I would like to ask all of us here is not how do we think about degrees and universities in terms of how does it relate solely to the economy? How does it relate solely to translating your qualification for a job? But what sort of society do we want? Do we want a place in society that allows us to ask core fundamental questions about what we are here for, how we get ourselves out of the problems that we're concerned with, um, and that really engages with some of the ethical concerns of the world in a way that is autonomous from the market. Now, I've got no objection to the idea that learning happens in many different places. I've spent my life studying informal learning. But some of the things we know don't happen in informal learning spaces are critical questioning about the status quo. And so one of the questions I'd like us to ask when we're thinking about beyond degrees is what do we lose if we either conceptualize degrees just as exchange for economic purpose or as something that can be done anytime, any place, anywhere. Where do we protect the spaces for us to think hard about society? Thank you, and I feel 
very bad trying to get us back to the market now because I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna turn My to job a, is done. I'm gonna turn to a, yes you've made me feel guilty about the next question. I'm gonna turn to Rabia to actually talk about the view of the employers on this. I mean you you look at employment, people apply, and a big part of what you do is help people signal their readiness and hence the, the, the things they use to signal their readiness. Do you see this changing? Uh, will employers accept a new form of signals? I guess let me start off by saying my answer to the question is obviously context specific. The context that I'll be speaking about is a very Middle Eastern one, which might not be true on a global level. And then secondarily, it's about education for employment, not for other purposes. So when I look at education's role, it's about the role of the, at education helping people get a job. And I think I just want to start off with the uh, massive problem we're facing in the region, which is the fact that we need to create 100 million jobs in the next 10 years. And so no matter how well we prepare our populations from an educational perspective, not all of them will be able to find jobs because the jobs just aren't there. And that's part of the challenge. And so if I look at the context of what a degree means in helping someone find a job, when we started off bait, we had a few hundred thousand people on the database, and employers had three or four criteria that they could filter applications by. Today, we have over 18 and a half million professionals on the database, and on average, every job gets over 1,000 applicants. And over time, what employers have asked for is a lot more criteria by which they can filter by. Education is one of the most important criteria, so it's a starting point. It helps someone get through the door. But increasingly, over time, other forms of badging have become important. As I get more and more people applying to my job, I get to choose amongst more signals as to which signal matters to me. But these additional signals don't come at the exclusion of the initial signal, which is an educational one still in the region, which is high on everyone's priority list. The, the other challenge, too, in badging in general is just validating which badges make sense. So we've seen professional networking sites all over the world try and get people to peer badge their experiences. And the more badges there are out there and the more people who are endorsing you for these badges, the less the badges mean. And that's why a Harvard badge, and it is a badge, remains a very important badge because it is a way of saying this badge stands out from the tens of thousands of other badges out there. And it's different than a random person you met over a cocktail endorsing you. And so giving badges meaning is, is extremely important, and degrees remain essential to get a job in this region. And I think for the foreseeable future where employers have so much choice, it will continue to be an essential part of the, the problem and solution. Thank you. I think we're going to try to look at this from now a fourth angle before we open it up for discussion. Um, and just before, can we show the video uh, just before we turn to Obai now and try to look at this from the, the access angle as well? Hi, my name is Vera from Kenya, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, over education and unemployment. So in the society that I live in in Kenya, um, there is this attitude that um, you need to go back and get more education in order for you to get the job that you want. So much so that we have people in the market who have bachelor's degrees, uh, but they go back and get a post uh, um, postgraduate diploma and then they go back and get a master's and they still can't get the job that they want but they still feel like they need to go and get more education. My question to this forum is are we overemphasizing education because um, what happens in the real um, job situation, the real life situation is that you can start a career from very little education. It doesn't have to be employment, it can also be entrepreneurship. Start your own thing, own your own business. Secondly, is there a way that we can introduce very early, as early as primary school, entrepreneurship skills um, 
and self-employment skills that will help the youth think outside the box of employment and stop feeling like they need to go back to school over and over again and get that education. So, okay, to your point, the degrees seem to be, the papers seem to be becoming a little bit more worthless. And, and you do obey some work as part of the learner's voice here with post-conflict uh, situations and areas. Um, and is, is this something you're seeing more and more of? Is this, is, are we all emphasizing the degree as a piece of paper, less the kind of combination of skills that could lead to productive work? Yeah, um, I first want to, I think I want to make a comment that there's a difference between credentialing and education. Uh, the two are very, very different. Uh, getting a degree that's a credential, that's not getting an education. Um, an education is lifelong, it's not schooling, it's not university, it's everything that happens. And uh, no, uh, you know, a certificate cannot capture that. And yes, we may not need a certificate to get a job, but we do need an education to live a meaningful life. That is the bigger uh, question. Are we just uh, thinking about all these things to get a job? And uh, I mean, I, I've worked in uh, some leading companies in Canada, and I always question, okay, um, do I want to work with somebody who's not environmentally conscious, who's not, who's not, who's socially irresponsible? These are things I ask myself. And if it's just about uh, measuring uh, creativity and problem solving, David Orr gives a brilliant example. He says the Nazis were the most educated people on earth. They were problem solvers. They were talented people. And look at what they did. So there's something more. I don't know if we can capture it or measure it that we need to be thinking about. And this, these are the deeper questions. Uh, and I think you know, uh, that's what education is for, is thinking about education, first of all, being able to make those distinctions. And like uh, Professor Facer said, you know, questioning the status quo and the dominant paradigms. So that's, uh, this is uh, my perspective. Uh, and you know, and university didn't help me uh, to get necessarily the work that I had, but uh, it's still, has advantages socially and uh, intellectually speaking. So, so <clears throat> what does the future for our current institutions look like in this brave new world of availability of multiple learning sources, skills that can be certified by other people? I'm gonna open the floor to see if we have any comments here and maybe we'll do a quick poll at one point, but let's have a few comments from, please, the gent yeah, please, can we have the microphone here, please? Hi, uh, Jim Knight. I, my view on this is, I think, universities need to be a place where we go to think. There shouldn't be a place that produces a filter for employers. Uh, there are plenty of people who are not graduates, but who are capable of being graduates and are capable of doing the job that employers want them to do. Um, filtering, we can do other ways. Uh, and then we can have a more fluid relationship between work and learning. And we'd spend time coming out of work and going back to a place where we can just think uh, uh, more independently, as Professor Facer pointed out. Please, Ravi, you want to jump in? And then we'll go to the lady at the back there, too. Whether or not I think they should or shouldn't be, they are. And I think that just the de facto answer right now is employers, because they're spoiled with so much choice in massive unemployment situations, can filter any which way they want to. And one of the most basic ways they do currently is through education. Now, we can argue about whether or not that's a right or wrong way of doing things. But the pressure is on people who want to get employed in today's world to try and get as many of these degrees as possible in order to stand out from the crowd. Does that improve the overall societal situation? Does it create more jobs? I don't believe it does. But again, as from an individual selfish perspective, if I want the best job out there, I want to collect as many degrees as I can to do that. And when we survey people, and we, you know, we run these surveys all the time, in the region there is a large drive to continually get more certifications and more degrees in order to improve one's chance of getting a better job. And it's regretful that education has not become about learning, but it has become about passing an employer's screen. And again, I. I, I would say it's regretful, but at the same time, it is the society that we live in, in a time of massive unemployment, and I understand it. Okay, so Professor Rabia is bringing us back to what I would put in a less apologetic manner, the real world of work. We are going through 
the a very strange period of jobless growth around the world. And this is the number one out, risk outlook that the World Economic Forum recently identified moving forward. So there's something re very real about work needing these useless degrees. <laughs> So we, I'm going to let Kerry have a point, and then Mark, and then we're going to go to the two ladies in the back there. I think you have a mic. But just give us two seconds. Kerry? Okay, so I think um, what we tend to do is we conflate the economic and the educational. Um, we've got a serious economic problem. It's called capitalism, and um, it is really causing serious difficulty in terms of um, the, the, the current situation. I mean, you know, let's, let's keep it simple and let's name that, and let's flag that that's one of the reasons why... We have large numbers of people unemployed and why we have a race to the bottom in terms of individual positional competition. And that is driving the construction of education simply um, in the... And this is entirely economically unsustainable because there's a limit to how much debt you can rack up in order to do that before, frankly, you're not buying any goods anymore. So we've got a real problem around that. But then the other question is, is if we want a space to think, if as a society we want to be asking ourselves questions about... Um, how we live in the world, how we adapt to change. I don't necessarily think that our universities also are doing a bang up job on this. I mean, many of our universities are simply driving certification mills. I mean, if you read the global auction, you will see this. So there is a really hard question for all of us about how do we construct the spaces that allow us to conduct the research, to build the knowledge, to ask the questions, to enable us to adapt and to change to what's going on. And the answer isn't necessarily throw out the institutions and just have collaborative learning wherever you happen to be, nor is it pull up the drawbridge and keep universities exactly the way they are. We have to work out new ways of doing this. And I think one of the ways we might think about it is what's the nature of these sorts of organizations? What's the nature of these sorts of encounters? And how do we design building on this sort of wonderful basis, new ways of learning and engaging with each other to ask hard questions. So, is that on? Uh, I'm going to pick two fights at once. Yes. Uh, but, I, you know, it, 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 it's, it, well, well it, it's interesting because I, I think what we're hearing is the university is failing both at economics and at helping us think. Yeah. So maybe the, the video was right. I mean, just get rid of them altogether. But I'm not going to pick that fight. <laughs> Uh, but I, I think, but I, I think we need <laughs> at the core of your piece that I, you know, one piece I agree with. Ultimately, we are talking about citizenship, agency, critical thinking, and having spaces for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think to, to Connie's talk, the, the the putting ourselves in any educational setting in the physical box of the school or the university only to think that those spaces only are validated by that physical box is, of course, a, a silly and dangerous idea is even a dangerous idea in terms of how we evolve the economics of it. So if we want to have public money in spaces to think, those spaces shouldn't just be in the bricks and mortar of those places. And for me, the sad thing about that slide, maybe it was because of how the question was asked, is it's not online content versus bricks and mortar. It's that we are connected to each other socially. What happens online is actually human connection at its best. So I, you know, I think really to think of that as needing to invest in citizenship and that those spaces to think, but not to get in the box of the university. And that is going to break the economics of universities, and I hope it does. But on, on this side, I mean, I, I both, I think that that citizenship piece, at least for me as an employer, is key to getting all of those buzzwords of grit and creativity, like those critical thinking spaces that Carrie talks about, give me a lot of what I look for in an adaptive employee. So I actually see a connection between that aspect of it and what are some of those beyond degree things. But I actually have a, a pointed question for you as an employer, not as a person who runs an employment site is if I'm an engineer who applies for a job with you uh, and I've got kick-ass code and I can show you what I built, do you really care if I have a degree? The, the because quick, I don't. The, the quick answer to that is, I guess, the question um, hints at the answer. How do you get to show me that code when I have a thousand other people knocking on my door telling me they want to show me other things? So you, the usual selection process is I'll first check for places that I know generally teach good code. Once I have a short list from that alma mater, I then bring them in and try and find out on a relative basis who has the best code of the lot. 
But if you didn't have that degree to begin with, how are you going to show up at my doorstep in the first place when there are thousands of other people showing up at my doorstep? And that's the challenge. Are you saying you never get social referrals from other employee, employee, people you we know? We do. We do. And again, so in, in the overall recruiting cycle, the vast majority of employers continue to recruit primarily through searching or posting because that gives them the greatest volume of jobs. So there is a bit of a numbers game that goes on. And so there are exceptions to every rule, but as an individual, you're always playing to your own advantage. Gentlemen, I'm, I'm gonna throw in my moderator hand here and use my <laughs> executive powers. No, I did, promise you, I did promise you a very lively debate, but I think this, you've, you've both hinted at the core issue there, which is show me, how do you show me? But you also hinted at the fact that to be able to show and stand out and to get to the door, maybe once you get to the door, you can demonstrate all the other stuff. But then I want to pull in a few more comments before we take this further. But I think thank you, Mark, for framing the debate a little bit for us in terms of it's a paradigm shift. It's not, a, it's and, not an economic... And it's happening. Yeah, it's a happening. It's not an economic view. It's not a just a, a, socialist, a social uh, sort of discussion. But at least we're isolating a common enemy now. It's the university's current structure. So at least we're, we're, getting, we're getting closer as a panel together. Can we have the lady at the back there, please? Uh, yes. your name, and then you have the lady in front of you, please. OK. My name is Giselle Yamin. I'm from Lebanon IT department, uh, St. Joseph School. I have been hearing for the past three days many interesting, interesting things, many interesting new concepts, uh, critical thinking, assessment, all things that are now skills requested. And I agree. I agree to everything all of you have been saying regarding like. the degrees, regarding the skills, regarding all. My question is specific. We're thinking about what universities should do. Uh, my question is what should we do at schools first? Uh, knowing that we've uh, been working on the 21st century skills, which is now uh, the era, as we say, uh, which is now requested. The students should know how to collaborate, how to work with each other, how to uh, think critically, how to innovate, how, how, how. But yet, it's not that, uh, not all schools know about it, not all the world knows about it. How can we make this, uh, if it is the solution, how can we promote it worldwide to be the solution, to start with the solution, to enter the university after? Thank you. So can we lead in front of you? Sure, hello. Um, my name is Noha Mahdi. Um, and, and my question really is based on that scenario that you just drew out where you know you want to show the good code, but you need to get to the door first, is how do we how do we change that model? Um, and I, I just want to piggyback on, on what uh, Mr. Jim Knight said earlier um, and what you're referring to about badges. So, and I say this just as an, ex as an example, I'm a Harvard graduate, um, and so I have that Harvard badge, but no, you know, knowing that for myself, I know that that doesn't necessarily mean anything um, in terms of my skills or, or, or abilities or merits. And a lot of times, you know, I'll see people react to that in a way that um, is is unfair towards other people who have more skills and more abilities than I do. But people will look at me and say, "Oh, great, you have a Harvard degree. Come, let's talk to you." And so my question is, and I and I and I actually resent that um, in a way because it gives me an unfair advantage. And so. How do we shift, you know, what the door um, looks like, and how do we have people focus on what people can do and what their merits are, rather than some shiny badge, you know, that may or may not mean something um, about who they are? Thank you. So opening up even more questions here, and some of them going back to the to the primary education. Are these badges and new ways of thinking of acquiring knowledge ways to bring in these skills that we haven't been able to really bring into the mainstream? Maybe you want to think about some of these while we take two more comments and then we can react. Gentlemen here, please, in the front. We always ignore the front. And I'll look to my left. The gentleman here in front, just on the second row here, please. Hello, my, my name is Oscar Becerra. I come from Peru. In, in my country, which who, that has been growing for uh, over 6% for the last 10 years, every year. And uh, s I think 60 to 80% of the economy is informal. Mm. And they don't care about where do you come from as long as you can do things. So those jobs with the big, huge doors that pay the hundreds of thousands of dollars per year are very few. The hundreds and the thousands of jobs are of people who really do things for themselves mostly self-employed, and those are not looking for university 
degrees. They are looking for making things happen. And that is increasingly not coming from universities. It's coming for, from some universities, not from their degrees, but mostly from people who know how to do things. So I think that actually there is a shift. The, according to Professor Christensen from Harvard, the market for Harvard graduates who need uh, $200,000 per year just to pay their debt uh, are increasingly short. And the uh, Phoenix graduates, which are 100000 a year, the top 10% are still more than the Harvard graduates, and they are getting 50000 per year jobs and are performing well. So there is an increasing shift of where you learn to actually do things, not who says you know. Thank you. So that's actually a good, a good uh, segue into the world of work that is actually changing. Um, and it brings us back to the same question that keeps coming up, this, this question of how do I show? How do these people show what they have? So it's about showing. It doesn't have to be degrees, but you have, still have to show some of these. We'll take one more comment and then come back to see if you want to react to some of these. I think, thank you so much. Stephen Agong uh, from Kenya, Wise Education Leadership Alumni 2014. My concern is, as a vice chancellor, listening to this discussion, um, we should, there should be a serious paradigm shift in the sense that if we are going to increasingly look at education, especially at the university, as a source of just employment, then we have missed the point in terms of humanity and our values. Um, we must train students who are going to be job creators and not put the job employment uh, to be employed as an, an employee in an organization as the first value. Otherwise, we would lose it as, uh, as, as, as a community of humanity. Uh, secondly, having said that, um, I, I want to believe that there should be the minimum prescription, yes, for getting to be employed or to be an, an employer. But I would wish that we could attach some values other than just looking at uh, what is the degree, where did you go to school, as a form and a way of screening our graduates. Thank you so much. The gentleman at the back there, if you can stand up, they can see you better, sir. So thank you. My name is Rado Damian. I'm coming from uh, Romania, and I'm working for the Quality Assurance Agency in Higher Education in Romania. Um, I was chair of uh, the steering committee for higher education and research of the Council of Europe. So um, well, with that background, I see a danger in this discussion. It's becoming a bit reductionist, as it was a conflict between university and other uh, means to give people uh, documented evidence about the learning outcomes, achieved learning outcomes and competences. I think they are by no means excluding each other. Uh, now, uh, I don't know how many people know about the recommendation of the Council of Europe, which is as old as 20, uh, 2007, uh, making uh, very clear the four missions of the university studies. The first is, of course, uh, education for sustainable employment. Many people speak about that. The second is research, of course, extending the knowledge base. And the two others are very important, but we don't talk so much about them. It's personal development and uh, preparation for active citizenship in democratic societies. And the, uh, what is happening in university should cover the four missions, which is by no means always really a reality. And now, since it was so much discussed about the employment and the connection and what the uh, employers would demand, I agree, I'm an engineer, I'm not perfect. So I have even civil engineering degree. So I know that I would like to live in a building in which when the earthquake is coming, and in Bucharest we have seven on Richter, uh, it, it will stand. How about going to have surgery uh, by, how do you know it's a medical doctor or a quark who is experimenting anatomy on a live patient? So there should be something in his initial uh, education which 
would give confidence to the patient. So under these conditions in, in, in European higher education area, it, we have the concept of lifelong learning, which is covering a lot of possibilities, a lot of types of uh, uh, training. And what is, uh, I think, uh, not uh, being, and uh, this is my question, when we see uh, this discussion, do we really realize there are two types of professions uh, or competences? Some of them leading to engineering, medical school, music maybe, which are quite uh, sometimes called vocational, and some others are more general. So can we treat both equally in terms of value of diploma, diplomas and uh, uh, possibilities to, to be employed? Thank, Thank you. you, sir. So there's, a, there's a, a very interesting set of questions all leading to the, so maybe what we should be asking isn't beyond degrees, is this sort of degrees plus? Is this a degrees plus discussion as a first step? The other question is in defense of the institution as it stands now, do you want to go to a surgeon who has a few badges online uh, and let him operate on you? So I'm going to, just simplistically, I'm going to put these questions down and let you all react <laughs> to some of them. Mark, you want to jump in there? And then I'll buy. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I'm not going to tackle the surgeon question, but I would say those four Council of Europe definitions of a university absolutely are what the university should be. And most universities are, are failing to live up to that bar. Uh, so that, that's one topic. But I, I think that the degrees plus is certainly how Connie framed it and how I would frame it. I mean, the, the degrees are a useful and certainly used, to your point, signaling signal, you know, system in society. And so we actually rely on them to get jobs. We, they are actually a part of finding our future spouse. It's not just socializing at university, but signaling our status. But a huge part of the story of who we are is missing. Uh, and that's probably also always been true, but the depth of the things we learn, the things we can accrue as knowledge, experience, merit, grows, I think, in the digital world that we, we live in now. And even if it isn't growing, it is, there are ways we can represent it in a more nuanced way that we control and have agency and that we can trust. And so to me, that is really the, the core piece of this is, how do we give people the ability to tell a true and trusted story that is complete about who they are and what they know? And so the, you know, in the, to, to go back to Steve's question about aren't badges to Connie you know, gonna have all the same problems as degrees or, or worse? You know, maybe, but I do believe there's a, a urgent need to have something more nuanced that signals, especially as you have people going through these job filtering processes, but for many other reasons as well. And the only way to find something that lets us signal in a more complicated way or complex way, more true way, is to roll up our sleeves and try to figure it out. So that's the thing that, that is going on with the badges, piece of it, why we're involved in it, but many other things. And that's actually something I like about WISE. There are people here who are rolling up their sleeves to try to figure it out, and that's the, the, the place we should be. Thank you. Okay, I, I just wanted to comment on the question about school. And uh, I think the first step is really, it starts, it begins with us. That's, uh, you know, it sounds very fluffy, but it's the truth. We don't really ask ourselves very deep questions about uh, what we learn in school. I mean, one of them is what is education for? We go through a system and we talk about things and we never actually question the, the bubble. We're inside the bubble, we never ask questions. Another one, and this is a, a slightly strong criticism, Again, some of the things that are happening in this region is talking about technology, right? We, you know, we, we never learn philosophy of technology or to question technology. It's immediately kind of sometimes forced into places where it doesn't necessarily belong. And I love technology. I'm an engineer. So um, it's, but it's important to be critical about those things. Um, and, you know, like just the dominant paradigms and the vocabularies that are used to describe these things. I want to present a very simple example because we're talking about school. You know, we were just discussing earlier, talking about something like the Big Bang Theory. What does it assume, right? It assumes that it started randomly, for example. So already there, you're creating a bias, right, towards something that's not created or there's no creator. That, that's a very important thing to ask, right? What does it mean later when we talk about meaning and why we're here, right? Those names, um, the Stone Age, right, automatically, oh, primitive, right? You're learning history. Uh, this is the Stone Age. We don't call our age the age of garbage. 
right? Uh, we will look at what we did to the planet. These are very um, important questions. That I'm just throwing them like this. But I think, uh, you know, if we think about them first ourselves, and then we talk, there are many policymakers and ministers here, and that's something we're encouraged to do as the wise learners, uh, then maybe we can begin to see some change in that regard. Because it does start early on. It doesn't, you know, we don't, these things don't just come later. Okay, um, so one really quick comment is, I can't tell a complete story about myself and I'm me. I think the search for the thing that tells the complete story is actually, we might want to ask why, why we're doing that. What is complete. it? No, let me, yeah. More yeah, complex. I'm, yeah, okay. But I think there is a sense that you might be able to do that. Um, but I want to go to the point about the purposes of universities and the research, teaching, and service or civil function of them. And my sense is, there is a place to start in moving forward this whole debate, which is about reconnecting those three agendas of the university more seriously. Um, and what that means is, is to recognize that actually cutting edge research requires multiple forms of knowledge. It involves engagement with industry, it involves engagement with civil society. We've got a program, we have 300 projects across the UK, 20 million pounds worth of investment, where we have huge numbers of organizations working with universities to generate new insights and new knowledge and students are a core part of that practice. So if what we can do is get rid of the idea that knowledge production only sits in these little bubbles, but is something that is a social um, uh, network, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a large landscape where there are different jobs. There are the jobs of practice and then there's the jobs, if you like, of reflection and, and critical analysis of what's going on that remembers the history of what's gone before. I think that's part of the function of a university is that historical memory of what we already know so that we're not reinventing the wheel all the time. And I think the critical thing is if we can connect all of those things up, we generate an educational experience that is about acting in the world and reflecting on it at the same time. And at that point, frankly, you don't need a certificate because you you don't need to spend your time preparing to access jobs that exist out there because you've got the capacity to generate your own world, your own society, your own future. You won't be busy trying to jump through employers' hoops all the time because you'll be saying, this is how I build resilience and security for myself. I think it's incredibly high risk to have an education system that is premised around trying to work out what it is that these employers who won't necessarily be there in three years' time want. I would agree with the premise of degrees plus, and the question becomes, what is the plus? The challenge with a badge, I believe, is it might not be ambitious enough nor representative enough. I also had a badge from a great university. I attended Stanford, and I did electrical engineering. And I can tell you, as a matter of fact, when I graduated, I knew how to do nothing related to electrical engineering. <laughs> and I never worked in the profession, and I know even less now than I did back then. But I can still carry that badge around. And it's unfortunate that my badge doesn't carry with it a representation of my work. And so I think increasingly in a digital world, we can have our badges be connected to portfolios and evidence of things that we've actually done. And then there's a lot of meaning to that. And then the filtration around that becomes a lot more meaningful than just a pure symbol. So it is badging, but I think it's a, there's a depth to that that needs to happen even on the university badge, let alone any other badge. One of the risks is we're sort of swapping credentials here. Um, I also came out of a university that had a <laughs> prestigious badge to it. Um, and what I noticed was that those kids that had already been to the private schools and those kids that already had the social networks were able to do more with that badge than I was from the state school that I came up in. So we need to be aware that all of this stuff drops into pre-existing social relationships, networks, and existing inequalities. And sometimes what we're trying to fix, we put onto education, education, please will you sort all of these problems? Education cannot sort all of our problems. This is a fantasy projection. We desire that education fixes this for us. If we get the best qualification, the best teachers, the best technology, suddenly we fix all this stuff. Actually, some of this cannot be fixed by education alone. Some of it is about existing social, economic, and cultural structures. And we need to ask ourselves why we're not talking about those and addressing those questions, and why do we keep asking education to fix stuff that is actually fundamentally outside of it? 
Thank you, Kerry. And I think I think we all tend to agree, as you see, from that the, probably the, the issues and challenges are fundamentally deeper than what we're discussing as solutions. But there you had the self-confessed panel that say we're discussing beyond degrees from panel who have great degrees. And so uh, it's, one of those, it's one of those things in life. Uh, can, you, can you please, uh, yeah, please. Uh, my name's Cathy Ellis. I'm from Highbury College in Portsmouth. And I think just to put it into context, Highbury College is a vocational college. We, we have 10,000 students. We also describe ourselves as an entrepreneurial college. And we teach students from the age of 16 upwards whatever names you want to give them, lifelong learning, vocational, etc. We're a partner with a college in Saudi, where we are working in Saudi, helping to develop vocational education training. So my point is, I've come into this session, which was called Beyond Degrees, and I've heard a lot about schools and universities, and apart from my friend at the back here, who dared to mention the dirty word vocational, I've heard no mention about the need to really raise the profile and status of vocational education and, rec and training and recognise it as a really valid pathway. And some of the things we're talking about, you know, apprenticeships for years prove their, prove their worth by developing their masterpiece, their, their, their apprentice piece. We've done a lot of this in vocational education. Mm -hmm. So my, my question to the panel is, can I have your thoughts about a missing part of this conversation, which is vocational education and training? Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, I, I did promise you a very lively session and a strong debate, and I'm delivering, but we're running out of time. We're going to have two more comments. The gentleman here, can you please raise your hand? And the lady here in the front, will those, those two comments react to them and then some concluding remarks? Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Tom Whitby from New York. Um, I also have a degree in educational technology that I got in 1990. Not one piece of software or hardware that I worked on is in existence today from that degree. Um, technology is changing everything very, very rapidly. We've got an entire education system with educators who, whose education is steeped in 19th and 20th century methodology that they're very comfortable with. The methodology of the 21st century has to address the rapid change that we're going through. It's probably better to have these teachers teaching people how to learn than it is what to learn. How, how do we do that? How do we get these people going from the 19th and 20th century to the, where they should be? Thank you. That's another question about the, the methods we're using. I can tell you vocational is not a dirty word anymore, at least in this part of the world, because we've suddenly realized there's much more to the worthless degrees that people are unemployed with. Um, and it's a, it's a fact. We have, we have statistics to show the number of unemployed people. Can we have the final comment? And then we'll get reactions to some of Okay, two more final comments because of the gentleman. Okay, sorry. I will, and then we're going to ask you to react to these and one final maybe question and a quick poll of the audience, please. My name is Noor and um, I want to sort of like marry these two things, like vocational, I very much like understand that and also the idea of um, the professor's idea of uh, thinking about the big questions, the questions that are actually important to us as you know, a community. And the truth is that a good vocational training would include these questions about society. Like if you are an engineer, you should be learning about the effects of your engineering on, an, on the environment, et cetera. And personally, I think like one policy in general that I like to think about when we discuss like really big questions and it seems overwhelming is like, okay, try to create like small initiatives, small institutions that people can learn from. And I think what we, in this specific arena, what we need to do is create small, um, but really, really effective institutions that do this, that marry the vocational with these big questions, and they will get the um, fame that they deserve. I mean, we talked about like studio schools, we heard about studio schools, and about like colleges, when they look at a, a high school student who is graduating from a studio school or is graduating from this school that looks really, really interesting, um, they get special attention. So it's not necessarily like, oh, these like thousands of individuals need to go knocking at employers' doors or universities' doors. It's like the um, the special people that are, the special entities that are knocking on people's doors are the institutions, and then you can belong to that institution. And then it'll make it efficient but also maintain quality. And you've touched upon something we wanted to discuss today but couldn't, which is the role of the private sector and the employers 
and how what is their role in helping develop and deliver all of these new things that we need. Because God knows if we had government officials in this room and we we're talking about yet more things above degrees, they're going to be thinking, who's going to fund all this stuff? Who's going to fund lifelong learning? We can't fund four years of learning yet. And are uh, the private sector going to pay for it? You guys want to take more debt? Because this could be a dead in the water discussion when we start talking about funding lifelong learning. Can we have the final comment here? I'm going to ask them the whole panel to react to some of these. And then I'm going to poll the audience to see where do we stand at the end, beyond degrees or, or, or with sort of status quo. Please, sir. At the corner, where, in my opinion, at the corner of what all of these wonderful people are talking about, in particular our keynote speaker, <clears throat> is this whole notion of uh, when you reach when you, when, you, when you reach a fork in the road, take it. And that's what's happening. That's exactly what's happening. And the process is a slow one. We can't expect change to occur immediately. And it's happening. And it's happening through individuals and institutions that are having a voice throughout this wonderful world of ours. And then the second thing, I just want to caution us about this word paradigm. Thomas Kuhn, the father, the creator of the word, when paradigms shift, everything goes back to zero. Paradigms are not shifting, it's a slow process. It happens in the form of a process. When it shifts, everything changes. Everybody goes back to zero, and that's not gonna happen. It doesn't happen that way realistically in our society. The process is slow, so we just need to be patient with the process. It'll happen. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, and that's a fan fantastic way to think about this shift, change. Do you all have your color cards with you? We're going to use some very old school technology in the 21st century for you to just give us an indication of where we managed to get you in the last hour. And the question is very basic. How close are we to the end of the degrees as we know them? How close are we to the end of degrees as we know them? And these are colors. Green is very close, so we should close shop very far. In terms of timeline, is the red, color red? Can you put your hands up and show us? You can't show how you can't show both colors, sir. I can see what you're trying to do there. If you have to take a stand, how close are far? So I can see more red. I think I'm in the middle. Yes, a lot of I see a lot of people showing both colors, which is, but the majority are red. The majority are red. If you agree, and that's just telling me we're very far. Um, now maybe the the the, the panelists now. You can react to the fact that, you know, you can hear the people sing. It's very far. Is this because it's hardwired? Is this because it doesn't make sense? Is it because it's expensive? Or is it just because we are starting the process of a fundamental rethink as a society, but it's a slow process. We cannot, un you know, unwire what we have wired for the last 600 years or more. You want to come and start from my right and we'll just go. Okay, so to finish off, I want to say... I, I don't believe in throwing out everything that we had from the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, in particular, I go back to Dewey, um, and I think the Deweyan notion of education and change was that pragmatism was the way forward. In other words, action and reflection combined. I think the big challenge that we're facing now is to construct the institutions that enable us both to act and to reflect at the same time. And I think we are actually making some progress there. And the other old idea that I want to return to is Gandhi's ideas of village schools. And Gandhi always said, you know, basically, you have to have self-funding village schools if you want the education that you're in control of, as opposed to the one that somebody else pays for and imposes on you. So I think addressing the question of what the economic model of this new way of combining reflection and action is, is at the core of what we're doing. And I have to say, I think some of the most promising examples lie in the very old idea of the cooperative movement. We have one in nine people of us around the world are involved in a cooperative in one form or another, and that gets us away from an opposition between state and market, and it starts saying, how do we construct institutions that allow us to act, to generate income and well-being for ourselves? Can you imagine a situation where students came out of degrees not only having learnt history, philosophy, theology, whatever it might be, but also the capacity to act in and on the world and change their environment without having £50,000 worth of debt at the end of it. I wanted to dedicate my concluding remarks to the idea of apprenticeship. I yes. 
This is absolutely a brilliant idea, and I think it's uh, neglected completely in our discussions about education. I was reading a book called Learning in Likely Places, Apprenticeship in Japan, and it's a series of case studies about this before coming here in preparation for this panel. And I think this is very interesting because it's attention to the learner at its best. You know, I, I've tried online learning and it's very beneficial. I've gone through the university system, it's great. But there's nothing like uh, apprenticeship, really, when you get this attention over 10 years, not four years, over a lifetime. That's really uh, an interesting place to look for, and it changes you. And if you want to see a beautiful example of that, uh, watch Jiro Dreams of Sushi, and you can see what that, how eight years of practice transforms a human being. And I think this is something that we really need to talk, uh, talk about, and I invite everybody to learn more about apprenticeship. It's you know traditional. When we say traditional here, we mean post-industrial, but really traditional is way before that. And these human beings, like Jacques Ellul said, if societies that came before us could have achieved what we have today as technological advancement, but they deliberately chose not to because they anticipated some of the things that we might lose in the process. Now, this is a very big statement, and most of us are not used to hearing something like this, but it's a the truth. These were not primitive societies. They knew what they were doing, and they emphasized the human being as opposed to technological worship, for example, or worshiping a job. These are things that we do need to talk about. So thank you, thank you for bringing it up. Well done. Well done. Thank you. Mark. Um, so much. Um, I mean, I, I, I guess I, I want to maybe wrap my concluding thing, taking issue with one part of what you're saying, which is, you know, it, it is not technology that acts on us, or we have the choice whether technology is prescriptive or whether we shape where it goes. Uh, and in fact, right now we're at a point where we're making a tremendous amount of decisions over the humanness or non-humanness, the level of surveillance or control versus freedom and agency that we're building into the technological systems, the technological society that will shape what human choices are possible probably for the next few hundred years. And so the stakes of this, sort of kind of step outside of education, are actually quite high in terms of how we think about technology changing our lives and what we wanted to do. And education is you know, one place that that's happening. And so to, to me, the critical piece out of all of this, uh, which then the, the, the Beyond Degrees piece comes back to, is how do we think about education as something which is about agency, about citizenship, about being able to shape our lives? And then how do we enable that? Because that is something that is um, critical, easily gets lost, but then it, it is also the thing that feeds back into the kind of employees we want, right? I mean, it, it does for me, not just trying to make it all magically tie up in a bow, the ability to make choices and have agency over what I want my life to be like, how I can relate to technology, are also the things in the kinds of jobs we need, whether those are the informal jobs in Peru or an engineer that you need to be creative building, uh, you know, building your site. That is about somebody who has confidence, agency, and opportunity, and can, in many of the ways that you talked about, shape their lives. So I think that's what we need to be looking at. And to get back to the boring degree topic, we need ways to recognize and signal those things that we are trying to have agency over. Who we are, what we want to do in our life, what we're capable of. And I, I think we are in the process slowly of building that. That's the piece about rolling up our sleeves and doing it together. At the root of the debate is a definitional issue, which is what is a degree? And is a degree any different than a certification or a badge or a vocational training type of certification that I get? I think we all agree that the representation of learning today with a piece of paper is not a great representation. It doesn't tell us much about what a human being has actually learned or what they can do. And so I don't want to discount what various educational institutions allow us to do or various forms of training. I think the question now, is there a better way to represent that in order for a job seeker to shine in a crowded marketplace and for an employer to actually pick the best professional that they require? And I think with today's technologies, there, is, there are far better ways to represent what someone is capable of than a piece of paper with a seal on it. And I think the change that we're going to see is not the death of the degree, 
but the added dimensions that are possible to any degree, and they're possible because of the advent of technologies that let us represent ourselves far more accurately than we've ever been able to. Thank you, Abhi. And this, this helps us to, this helps me to wrap up this conversation to be just true to our, the title of our session. This is, we started with Beyond Degrees. Uh, we sort of moved towards discussing degrees plus, and, but then we opened up a whole discussion about what's the role of education in our lives. I think I have a, you know, it feels like th there's a sense of a paradigm shift or maybe a, a sort of a rethink, a whole rethink of, I'm gonna avoid paradigm shift, but there's a whole rethink about our societies. We're going through a global crisis. It was a financial crisis, it's an employ unemployment crisis, it's opening the doors to a societal crisis. We're rethinking almost the time to rethink everything. We're at that stage. So uh, the issue of what's the role of education in our life and how does it link to economic productivity is a long discussion that we can spend days debating. I hope you will have time to think more about that. There's a bunch of publications, Wise Matters, out there for you to continue thinking about these issues. Um, but for me, this was a very, very enjoyable conversation. I think we just literally started debating this issue. This started with a beyond degrees, and it felt like we we're going to discuss the value of badges versus you know, university degrees, but we're really now fundamentally asking what is education, why do we do it, how should we do it better, how do we link it to our being a better citizen and being more productive in an economic and societal manner. So, you know, usually in conferences I look at the clock waiting for the session to finish. This is a session I was hoping that wouldn't finish so quickly. I genuinely enjoyed it, so I want to thank all of you for your comments and seriously thank my panelists. <laughs> Have a great day.